hours, bro. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to step through some of this stuff just a little at a time. And we're getting ready to... So we're going to walk down these five C's a little bit. And that's what we're going to be doing in this class, basically. We're going to go through this stuff right down the line, mixing a few things in here and there. But we're going to talk about fire first. But before we talk about fire, we're going to talk about cutting tools. And what I want to do with you guys is I want to... Number one, we're going to have a knife, saw, an axe safety class real quick with my instructor so they can show, especially the younger people or people who are inexperienced in the woods, the proper way to use those items. Before we do that, we're going to talk about those items and what I would consider something that I'm going to buy for my kit versus something that might not be so good. And it doesn't matter what brand it is. It has certain input variables that make it better or not better. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay? So let's talk about knives. The very first thing that we need to talk about with knives is the size of the knife. How big or how small do I want my knife to be? And again, let's go back to I'm only carrying one. We're talking about our emergency kit. We're not talking about this is my day pack and I got, you know, a pocket knife in my pocket and I got a saw in there and I got a knife here and I got a knife in there. I got one knife. I fall out of my canoe. This is all I got right here because this is gone now. This is what I got. All right. One tool option we're talking about. What, do, what am I looking at for that knife because I know I'm never going to lose that one. And this, and this kind of goes back to some of my mentality on primitive skills, okay? Because there's two things that I think that you pretty much deserve what you get. If you don't have a knife and a ferro rod on your body, then you deserve what you get. Because you should never lose it. I mean, if I fall out of a canoe, I'm not going to lose my knife unless I lose my pants. I'm not going to lose my ferro rod unless somebody steals my drawers. So, it shouldn't be a problem with being able to affect fire as long as I understand the input variables. I ain't never going to have to make a bow drill. I'm never going to have to go out and beat a knife out of a rock. Those two things are very important because those two things will keep you alive above and beyond anything else. Your knife can make everything else on that list if you know how to do it. All right? So, size. For me, it's five to six inches. All right? Again, I'm going to go back to a history lesson. Most historical knives that were carried by people from Native Americans after European contact and they were able to get metal to the long hunters all the way through, you know, the woodsmen of the 19th century were this size. It's functional. It will do small carving tasks. It will do large chopping tasks if absolutely necessary. Is the biggest right? reason that I say five inches at a minimum is because I have to understand that if I don't have an axe or I don't have a saw, I may have to, in an emergency, baton my knife. And that's a last resort. You don't want to just go around. You see a lot of bushcraft people baton their knife like it's just for giggles. You don't want to do that unless you have to because you've got to learn to conserve your resources. And anytime I take a chance on damaging a resource, I'm not conserving it. And every time I smack that knife with a big log, I'm taking a chance on breaking that knife and not conserving a resource. So if I have to baton it, it's only because I've lost all other means of processing firewood or cutting down trees or anything else, and i got to baton my knife. Now, what's the biggest tree that I'm ever going to want to tackle or cut down to try to make something with? I don't need anything bigger than four inches. A four-inch sapling will hold your weight all day long if, I, if you had to shimmy across it. It will hold a ridge line and anything you want to pile on it for a shelter all day long. And if you split it four ways, it will give you fuel for a fire all day long. So you don't ever need to tackle anything bigger than four inches because that's just a waste of calories and energy at that point. And again, you're not conserving your own resources in your body of the calories and hydration that you have because you're wasting your time and energy by cutting on something bigger than you need. All right. So the reason I say five inches is because if I have to baton my knife, through a four inch tree, all right, here's where I'm going to be hitting my knife. I'm not going to be hitting it here where my hand is. I'm going to be hitting it here. If I bury this thing down in a four inch tree and I only got a four inch blade, now what am I hitting? My hand or the back or, my, or the handle where it's most likely to break if it's not full tang, if it's a mortar or something like that. It's most likely to break right there at the joint and I don't ever want to do that. So I want something out here I can beat on because if I snap the tip off this thing, I still got a knife. If I bust the handle off of it, I got a spear. I got nothing anymore.
okay? So I want to make sure I can serve that. And to have that one inch sticking out of that four inch tree gives me that ability to continue to process that wood. That's the reason for the five inches, in my, in my personal opinion. Beyond the history, beyond everything else, that's the reason for the five inches. Anything bigger than six inches really becomes unwieldy for doing fine carving tasks, skinning game, gutting fish, and things like that. You need to stay below that six inch mark, and most of the butcher knives throughout history were about the six inch mark. Five and three quarters to six inches for butchering animals. So that's why I like to stay in that range. Okay, let's talk about material. Material. The only thing I want is high carbon steel. 1095, 01, A2, those are good high carbon steels. You never want a knife that's stainless steel. You don't want a knife that's made, that's what they call, uh, I don't know what they call it, mixed metal. I got lost a word in my head, but you don't want a laminated blade because most of them are stainless over carbon. The reason for this is, back to the multifunctionality of my tools, if I have a stainless steel blade, I can't hit it with a rock and drive sparks off of it. And we'll talk about that later when we get into fire. But the only way I can effectively strike sparks off my blade with a rock is if it's high carbon steel, because it has to have a high iron content in it to be able to do that. We'll talk about that when we get into fire in a little while. So just for now, Understand what I, understand that you want it to be high carbon steel. <coughs> the next thing you want is you want it to be full tang. And this is an, uh, this is for obvious reasons, like we just talked about, with the batoning factor, the prying factor. You want a full tang knife, and full tang means that that knife is made out of one solid piece of metal with scales bolted to the side. It's not it's not a rat tail. It's not something shoved into a handle with a piece of antler or a piece of wood, it's one solid piece of metal, like this one, where you can see the metal all the way around, and the handles are bolted to the, to the metal. That's a full tang knife. You're very, very unlikely to ever break that knife, unless you snap the tip off of it. But you're very unlikely to ever break it here. And that's what you want, okay? And that's for durability. More than anything else, it's for durability. Okay, 90 degree <laughs> spine. This is, this is where we start getting into the tough part, okay? You want a spine that's 90 degrees on that knife. And what I mean by that is you want that thing to have a sharp edge on both sides here. Most knife companies do several things nowadays for customer satisfaction and non-complaint reasons. One of the things that they do is they round the spine of the knife so that it's less uncomfortable on your thumb when you're carving with it. That 90 degree spine can become uncomfortable on your thumb over time of carving and things like that. So they round that spine so it's more comfortable for your little hands. Okay? <laughs> that 90 degree spine is the only thing that's going to allow you to drive a good set of sparks off of ferrocerium rod. I'm going to do that because that is damaging a resource. That knife blade is a resource to you and the more you have to maintain it and resharpen it, it's not going to last as long. So if you've got that 90 degree spine on there, you'll be able to drive sparks off of that ferrocerium rod very easy, even if you don't have the little striker that came with the ferrocerium rod. That's just another piece of equipment you don't have to carry if you got the right knife, okay? The other thing that most knife manufacturers do nowadays that you want to avoid is you want this knife to be non-coated. Most knife manufacturers nowadays will coat the blades of their knives with some type of dura coat or black epoxy or something, and the only reason they do that is to keep it from rusting. Because they don't want you to call them and say, My knife got rusty, well, that's because you didn't take care of it. But they don't want to have to hear that, so they coat the knife. The problem with putting that coating on the knife is back to flint and steel fire striking the back of this knife with a piece of rock. If I've got a coating on here, I can no longer drive iron flakes off here and make sparks with it anymore. So I'm at the mercy of either taking an angle grinder and grinding that epoxy or whatever they got coating that thing, a Duracoat off of there, or I just buy the right knife to begin with, okay? So these are, these are the main factors that I look at when I'm going to buy a knife. I want that thing to be 5 to 6 inches. I want it to be a high carbon steel, full tang, with a 90 degree spine, and non-coated. If I have all those things, 
that knife becomes multifunctional for me and becomes a great usable resource. Anything less than that diminishes the usability of that resource. And that's what's important for us to remember is we want that thing to be, if it's going to be a one tool option, then it has to do as many things as possible and it has to do them all well. Okay? And this will give you that. And like I said, a little, an old hickory butcher knife that costs 15 or 20 bucks will do all of this. No question about it. Okay? May not be the family heirloom that a blind horse is for 200 bucks, but it'll do every one of these things, no problem. The blade might be six and a quarter on it, if I remember right, but it's high carbon steel, it's full tang, it's got a 90 degree spine, and it's not coated. So you don't have to spend the big bucks necessarily to get what you want, you just got to be selective about it, that's all. It's all about what you can afford to do and you upgrade over time. Now, before we go into discussions uh, about fire, and, or about knife safety and axe safety and uh, saw safety, you want to show them some examples of knives that I wouldn't buy? Yeah, like the tactical, like the, the famous K bar. Yeah, here's a tactical, not practical for you. And these are all students that have. This, is a, this is a nice brand new Army K bar. Snapped at the hilt from Batani. Is it full tank? No, they're, they're not full tank, they're rat tail tank. Here's a Buck 119. Oh, <laughs> snap. Made in China. Here's a, here's a famous. I won't even say his name. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate, right? That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. I broke it one time now. Yeah. All right, so. Just a few examples. And there's a silky saw somewhere. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of silky saw or not. They're an up-and-coming brand of saw. I wouldn't waste my money on that either. We broke one of those last week. Oh, was some snapping on a twig. Snapped it on a, about a one-inch tree. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, like I said, you don't have to spend the big bucks to get a good knife. Old Hickory Butcher Knife will do, will last, outlast any of them knives that cost five times on the liquor stores. You just got to be selective in what you're buying, and it just depends on what you want personally. If you can afford a $300 knife, and that's what you want, buy it. If you can only afford an Old Hickory Butcher Knife, and that's all you can afford, I definitely would buy that before I'd buy something off of Bud K that costs 12 bucks for sure. Okay?